All right, your assignment for this week is to uh, begin working through the list of uh, programming challenges that we talked about in class. You'll note that we didn't really talk about anything to do with programming in R, and we just really just got your website set up. Um, so this tutorial is going to do a couple things. First of all, I highly recommend reading uh, chapter two here in Programming for Psychologists and looking at Danielle Navarro's core tool toolkit. Uh, these will show you lots of helpful ins and outs of using R to do things that uh, you can apply to solving the programming challenges. What we're going to do in this tutorial is take a look at a sample problem. This isn't one of the problems that's assigned, uh, but it's similar to those problems. The goal of this tutorial is to show you uh, how we're going to use variables, logic, and looping to create an algorithm that solves a particular problem in R. Here's the problem we, I have set up for us. It has two steps. First, create 100 random numbers from the range 0 to 100, and then two, add up only the numbers that are larger than 50. Uh, in this tutorial, we'll see we can accomplish this goal uh, in lots of different ways in R. And by uh, seeing what's going on here, uh, you'll be exposed to numerous methods for uh, writing code in R that will be helpful as we go through this course. So first of all, let's try to break down the problem and start with the first thing. How do we create 100 random numbers from the range 0 to 100? In order to do this in R, you would have to know about some intrinsic functions. So I happen to know that uh, R has a function called R-U-N-I-F. And this allows you to sample numbers from a uniform distribution. If you want to look at the help file for functions in R, you can do that by, first of all, you have to know what the name of the function is. But if you go into the console and type a question mark followed by the name, press enter, the help file will pop up over here under help. We're going to be using this function, R-U-N-I-F. And it has uh, three inputs, n for the number of numbers you want to sample, and then min for the range, the smallest number, and max for the largest number. Uh, so let's try this out. We want to sample 100 numbers. I'm going to put a comma in a space. I'm type min equals 0, comma, max equals 100. I'm just going to run this line of code. All right, so R has generated 100 random numbers and it's printed out those numbers below this code block. So first I want to store my numbers. I want to create a variable name called sum numbers, and we'll use the assignment operator to put these numbers into this variable. So now if we run this line of code, we won't see the numbers being printed out, but we will see that we have a variable. Oops, actually, I've got a bunch of things in here from before. We can see our sub numbers variable right here. But as a reminder, I'm going to show you that we can clear our workspace and start again. So I'm clearing this. Our environment is now empty. I'm going to run this again. And now we can see that there's a variable with some numbers in it. If we want to double check that our variable has those numbers in it, we can always write the name of our variable in the console and press enter, and it will uh, print that out for us. Every time we run this line of code, R will sample uh, new random numbers into this variable. Okay, 
So that's one way that you could create uh, 100 random numbers. I'm going to show you that uh, there's different ways of writing this. For example, I'll just copy this line, paste it down here. Uh, we don't actually need to write min and max in order for this to work. R will know that the first number in this position will stand for the minimum value, and the second number, or I guess the third number here, uh, will stand for the maximum value. So if we run this line of code in the console, it will also generate 100 random numbers. And of course, if we wanted to uh, generate a different amount of numbers, for example, 50 numbers, we could uh, change this number. If we wanted to change the range from 0 to 1,000, we could change these numbers. But we'll just leave it as 100. And I'm going to com comment out this line, because uh, we don't need to run this thing twice. But I'm leaving this here as a, an example uh, of a different syntax for accomplishing the same goal. All right, I'm just going to make a little note to myself, create 100 random numbers. That's what this code block does. I'm going to save my file. And uh, just as we go along, we can see that we're printing out our, our markdown document, and it's showing us the code. All right, the next thing that we need to do in this uh, problem is add up only the numbers that are larger than 50. Well, how would we do that? There's a whole bunch of ways we can do that in R, and uh, this will illustrate. Uh, first, we'll, we'll look at using logic and looping in order to accomplish this. So add, I'll do two hashtags add up only numbers greater than 50. Make a little code block. Now let's think about what we want to do here. Essentially, it would be good to go through every single number in our list. Um, so let's see, what, what, what is in our list of numbers here? OK. The first number is 65, so we'd want to include this number. The next number is 0.62. We wouldn't want to include that number. The third number is 93. We would want to include that number in our sum, and so on. Uh, so just talking out loud, we, we can notice what the algorithm is. We need, we need to go through each number and check whether or not it's greater or less than 50 and keep the number if it's greater than 50, and don't keep the number if it's less than 50. So how do we do that in R? Well, we could use uh, a loop with some logic. The loop is going to systematically go through each number and evaluate whether it's greater or less than 50. We can use a, uh, some logic statements to evaluate uh, whether the number is greater or less than 50. So let's make a little loop. In R, we can use something called a for loop. And here's what the syntax looks like. You write the word for, uh, followed by parentheses, followed by curly braces. OK. And what we want to do is loop through each of the numbers that are in this vector. This vector has 100 numbers. All right, uh, what I've just entered in here is i in 1 and then colon 100. Uh, what's going to happen in this loop is the variable i will take on the value uh, in the span of numbers between 1 and 100. Just to show you that this is what happens, we can uh, print out the value of i. So what I've done is um, put one line of code 
in between these curly braces. Uh, this line of code, I'll put a comment here, gets run each iteration of the loop. To see what that means, let's, uh, well, first of all, let's just change this from 1 to 100 to 1 to 10. And I'm going to run this uh, little code block. And what we see is the numbers 1 to 10 being printed out. This is the value of i in the first iteration of the loop. i is a 1. And then i becomes a 2, and then a 3, and then a 4, and then a 5, and a 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So um, this is one thing worth knowing about loops. Now how can we use i to help us evaluate numbers inside of this vector? Uh, Okay, before I show you how to do that, I want to talk about indexing particular values in a vector. We can do that using square brackets. Okay, so check this out. We've got our variable name, followed by two uh, left and right square bracket, and I put a number in there, the number one. Let's take this, put it in the console, and see what happens when we run it. What's happening is uh, r is returning the first number inside the vector. So anytime we change this index value, I'm going to run it again just by pressing command return. Now, now we see the output underneath the code block in the r markdown document. That's the second number. We can get the third number. And the fourth number. Oh, let's make a note here. Get a specific number at its position in the vector. Uh, you'll learn that there's uh, lots of ways to index parts of uh, a vector in R. For example, if I wanted the first three numbers, I could go 1 colon 3, and that will return the first three numbers. Um, so this property of R that allows you to index particular parts of a vector is pretty useful. Um, let's go back to our loop and I'm going to take this, copy it, and I want to print out something else. So rather than printing out the value of I, I want to print out the value of i, sorry, the value of some numbers at each i position. I'm going to actually, I'll do two things in here. Let's have r print out both the value of i for each iteration of the loop and the number that's inside this variable at that position of i. I'm going to copy this, put it in the console, and then press return. Let's just scroll up to see what we're looking at. So in the first iteration of the loop we print i, and i is 1, and we also print the first thing inside some numbers. So this would be equivalent to writing some numbers uh, with a 1 in it because at the first iteration of the loop, i is a 1. And then i turns into a 2, and we're printing out the uh, number that's in the second position of the sum numbers variable. And then i becomes a 3, and prints out the third number, and so on. So this is a, a nice way to see the action of a loop. I'm going to copy this again, make a, another loop, and uh, what I want to do now, uh, so w w what we've done is we've created a way to systematically go through each number in the variable sum numbers. And uh, I would like to now evaluate whether that number is greater than or less than 50.
So let's look at how we could do that. In order to do that, we can use an if statement. So we type if, parentheses, and left and right curly brace. I'll delete that. Okay. We're going to, inside the parentheses, we're going to write some numbers, i, and greater than 50. So this statement is a logical condition. Uh, what's going to happen is if the number at a particular position is greater than 50, then whatever we put here in between these curly braces will get executed. So for example, let's print the word true. And let's have another condition. We can write the word else. And uh, we're basically saying here, uh, if this logical condition is not met, that is for if, if the number is not greater than 50, let's do something else. We've made another little space to write some code in between some curly braces. We can write print false. Let's see what's going to happen if we do this. I'm going to copy the code into the console. And now we're seeing a list of true and false. So it's telling us that the first number is true, so it must be greater than 50. The second number is false, so it must be less than 50, uh, or equal to 50, I suppose, and, and so on. We can add uh, some more printouts just to see what's going on here. Uh, so for example, uh, we could print i, and we could print some numbers i. Let's do that. And we'll do that for both of these conditions. And now let's run this and see what happens. Let's go up to the top. All right. Uh, so when i is 1, we see that the number in the first position is 65, and that's greater than 50, so it also prints out true. And the num uh, when i is 2, the number in the second position is 0.62, that's less than 50, and it's correctly printing out false. So we can quickly go through and see that uh, we're getting the right answers here. All right. So we have a way of evaluating whether our number in each point in the vector, in each position, is greater or less than 50. The next thing we'd like to do is save all of the numbers that are greater than 50 and discard all of the numbers that aren't. Um, for example, we could create a new variable that uh, is begins as an empty variable, let's call it saved numbers. Now, how do you make an empty variable that doesn't have anything in it? Um, one way to do that is to use the C function. You'll learn a lot about this function. You just write it like this. You put a C followed by parentheses. And if we run this, let's see what happens. We should have a new variable called save number, and notice it's says null, that means it's empty. If we type it into the console, we'll see that it doesn't have anything in it. But it's a place where we can store things. All right. What I'm going to do is copy this loop that we made. And I'm going to delete some parts. I'm going to put a comment here inside the else statement that we don't need to do anything here. Okay, 
I'm going to delete all the stuff inside of this part of the if statement. Uh, anything we put in here will uh, get evaluated when this logical condition is met. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to uh, take the value that is greater than 50 and append it or add it into this variable saved numbers. I'll show you how that works, at least one way to do it. Okay, I might be wondering what is going on here. First of all, let's run this line of code to see what happens. Um, actually, another way to do this, you can highlight all the code. I'm pressing command return and it automatically copied all of this into the console. And let's take a look at what's inside our saved numbers variable. As you can see, it's got two numbers in it, and we've saved the two values that are actually greater than 50. If we wanted to get all of the 100 numbers that are greater than 50 in our variable, we could simply change this loop from 1 to 10 to 1 to 100 and rerun this. Now when we look at this variable, we'll see, oh, it looks like there's about 50 numbers that are greater than 50. All right, just change that back to a 10. Okay, but I'd like to take some time to explain what exactly is going on here. And to do this, we're gonna go outside the loop and uh, let's create a variable called a that's empty using the c function like we did before. I'll say create empty variable as a comment. So now we've got this a variable. It doesn't have anything in it. Um, let's create a variable that does have something in it put a 1 into a b. All right. And for fun, I'm going to create another variable called d. And I'm going to put three numbers into it. So this is one way where we can uh, create a variable that has multiple things in it using the c command. Now c is short for combine. What we're doing here is we're combining the numbers 1, 2, and 3 into a variable called d. Uh, another little note here, I've been making uh, variables for illustration purposes using letters a, b. Notice I didn't use the letter c, even though that would come next in the alphabet. And, and that's because c is a special thing in R. It's a function for combining variables. But let's take a look at our d variable. Yep, it's got the numbers one, two, and three. All right. Let's say you wanted to add on another number to D. D currently has three numbers in it. And let's say we wanted to tack on a fourth number. And um, let's say we wanted to, for example, tack on the number that's in the variable b. Let's take a look how that could work. We can use the combine function and we can combine the contents of variable d, a comma, with the contents of variable b. If we run this one line, let's see what happens. All right, down here we can see one, two, three, and a one. So one, two, three is the contents of variable d and the one is the contents of variable b, and now we've just combined them all together. So for example, if we wanted to do that for, um, and, and uh, add into the variable a, which started out being empty, we could do something like this. So now variable a has uh, a one, two, three, and a one in it. 
All right, the next thing to understand is that you can keep adding onto a variable by combining more things onto the existing variable. So let's take a look at this. I'll just make a note, adding on to an existing variable. All right, so let's say I want to add the number two onto the end of variable A. So this little command is saying combine what is what is in variable A with this stuff at the end. Okay. So if we run this and uh, well, first of all we can see we're going to get the numbers one, two, three, and one, which are the numbers that were in A, and then we added on a two. And we can put these numbers back into the variable A itself. I want to point out something that I did here. First of all, if I type variable A into the console and press enter, we're going to see what's currently inside A. And it's only the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 1. That's because I didn't run this whole line of code. All I did was I highlighted this little section and ran this little section. If I want to run the whole line, I'd have to highlight all of it and then run it. So notice the difference here. That's just running the section. And this is now taking the output of this section, which is 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, and putting that into variable A. So now if we look at variable A, it will have all of the numbers in it. Okay, so uh, this is a long way of explaining what we did back up here. We started out with an empty variable called saved numbers, didn't have anything in it. And then in each step of the loop, we appended a new number uh, onto the contents of this variable using the C command. So notice here, we're combining the existing uh, numbers in this variable with the number that is greater than 50. Sometimes it can be helpful to unpack a loop and see what's happening each step of the way. So let's do that. I'm going to copy this whole thing down to the bottom. And just so you can see how this variable is behaving over time, what we're going to do is print this variable. So we're going to see uh, how this variable changes over the first 10 steps of the loop. Um, is that didn't look like that worked. Not sure why. Let's try again. Oh, I see. Um, Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, okay. So if we run this loop, what we see as the output is two things, null and then a 65. So in the, oh, actually, I'm going to add one more thing here to help us I added print i. So notice this is outside of our if else statement. That means this number is going to get printed every step of the loop. And this will help us understand a little bit more clearly what is going on in the loop. So let's run this code. Okay. When i is 1, the value inside of uh, saved numbers happens to be null. Hmm. Sorry, I'm going to help us out a little bit more. Take this part and 
put it underneath here. I think this might help a little bit to see what's going on. Let's run this line of code. All right. Okay. And the first step of the loop, i is a one, and our saved numbers variable has nothing in it. In the second step of the loop, i is two, and we've appended, we've added a new number onto saved numbers. It's 65.09. On step three, we haven't added any more numbers. Step four, oh, we've added another number. So saved numbers is now 65 and 93 and so on. So we keep adding every time um, our value is greater than 50. Okay, there are other ways that we can do this, and some of them are a little bit faster in terms of computer time in R. Let me show you one more way to do this. Take all of this code, copy it down, and get rid of these printing things. And we're going to introduce the concept of a counter. So if I create this variable, now we have an empty variable called the counter. And what we're going to do for each step of the loop is increment the counter. We want it to start at one, and for each step of the loop, get bigger by one. So here's one way we could do that. And for example, just so that we can see how this variable behaves, we'll print out the counter. And it should, uh, we're, get, we're getting uh, numeric zero everywhere. Why is that happening? Let's see, if I run this, we get an empty variable. What happens if I run this? Okay. Oh, interesting. I guess you can't add a one to something that is empty. So we can change that. Let's start off with a zero in our counter. So now the counter has a zero, all right, so that means we should be able to add one to our counter, counter plus one, and doing this will update the value in here. So now that's a one, all right. So if we start here again and rerun this, our counter will be initialized to zero. And when we run the loop, we're gonna see that it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, keeping track of where we are in the loop. Um, <laughs> in some ways, this counter is behaving exactly like, like our i variable. Now, what I propose is instead of incrementing the counter at this point in our loop, which is outside of the if, if statement, let's put it inside of the if statement right here, just like this. So this counter is going to go up only when the number we're evaluating is greater than 50. Uh, if we were to run this uh, little bit of code here, at the end of it, the value in the counter should tell us how many numbers in our list were greater than 50. I think we know that there's two, so if we type counter, we can see that, yep, there's two numbers total. What I'd like to do though is use the value of the counter as an index into saved numbers as a way to store a new number. So let's delete this and add square brackets 
put the word counter there and we'd like to put the value of our current number that is greater than 50. So this is another way to add values into a vector. Similar to this way, but using a different syntax. Let's see if it works. I'm going to run all of this code. Now let's take a, take a look at our saved numbers. There should be a few of them in there. Or there's two. There they are. Now what's happened here is every time our value is greater than 50, we increment the counter by 1. So the first time that happens, the value in this variable will be a 1. And in this line, uh, we will be indexing into the first position of this variable, and we will be storing a number into that position. The next time the loop encounters a number greater than 50, we'll increment our counter. So the value in here will be a 2. That will, means we'll be indexing into position 2 of this variable and we'll be storing whatever this number is in there. So this is a, another way to add numbers into a vector. Okay. You might have lost track of what problem we're trying to solve. Remember, our problem was uh, add up only the numbers that are larger than 50. We've created a way, uh, well, actually, let me repeat that. We want to get 100 random numbers from 0 to 100, and then figure out which ones are larger than 50 and add them all up. I'm going to make a new code block. And uh, so we've done a bunch of things. Let's go back and put it all together. Here's the line of code that allows us to create 100 random numbers. Uh, here's some code that allows us to evaluate. So I'm just going to add some comments. Create numbers. Evaluate which ones are greater than 50. Now we need to change our index to go from 1 to 100. We know that this code works, so at the end of the day, the, the values in saved numbers should be all of the value, all of the numbers that are greater than 50 in, inside of this variable. The next thing we need to do is add up the numbers. Now, there's an easy way to do this in R using the sum function. And you can... I'll, show you how, to, how this works, but basically you type the name of the variable that contains some numbers you want to add up. So if we ran all of this, uh, we've got our sum here. That just works. I'm going to quickly give you a few more examples of using sum. So if you wanted to on the fly just add together say three numbers, if you tried to put them in here like this, that's, is, does that work? Oh, I'm surprised that works actually. What I thought you had to do was create a variable or a vector like this. Um, so I guess this works and so does that. So you can put numbers in directly like this, uh, but typically you would do something like create a variable with some numbers in it and then sum up that variable. All right, so we've accomplished our goal. Uh, let's look at a few other ways we can accomplish our goal. Uh, and just as a review, uh, what we were looking at was storing some values in a vector using a loop along with some logic to systematically evaluate the contents of that vector. We're storing the numbers we want to store, and then we're doing some analysis of that by taking the sum of those numbers. 
as you become more familiar with R, you will learn that um, there's many ways to do the same thing. So let's create some numbers. Here we go. And it turns out we could find the sum of all of the numbers that are greater than 50 in one line in R without even using a loop. And the way we can do that is by using logical indexing. And write the name of our variable, followed by square brackets. Oops, I almost made a mistake. Some numbers, plural. And now we can write a logical condition in here. Just like this. What I'm saying, kind of in plain English, is uh, list all the numbers in this variable that are greater than 50. So if we run this line of code, what we'll see is uh, we're not reprinting out all of the 100 numbers, we're only printing out the numbers that are greater than 50. Now if we wanted to take the sum of these numbers, we could simply add the sum function. We're putting these restricted numbers into this function and um, getting the sum. So it works just like that. I'm just going to write these two steps as separate lines. All right. So you don't always need to use loops and logic to accomplish goals in R because the indexing capabilities are quite powerful. All right. I'm going to introduce you to a slightly more advanced topic here, and that is the use of functions in R. We've come across a few different functions in this little tutorial. One of them is called RUNIF. We also looked at the sum function. We looked at the combined function. These are all intrinsic functions. If you look them up by typing question mark and the name, oops, you'll see that there's a help file. R comes with a lot of intrinsic functions, and we'll learn more about those as we progress in the course. Functions take an input, they do something, they return an output in general, and you can write your own functions in R. There's a general syntax. I'm just going to give a name, first of all, to go, it'll look a lot like what we've seen before. So here's, I'm creating a function, I'm calling it my function. We use the assignment operator. We write, write the word function, it will turn blue. Then we use parentheses and a curly braces. Inside the parentheses, you put a name of the input. So let's just use X. And inside the braces, uh, you get to do some processing on the input and return an output. For example, let's say I'm going to take the value of X and I'm going to add 50 to it. And I'm going to put the output of this into the variable A. Then I'm going to return A. So what's going to happen here? If I run this line of code, in the environment you'll see there's a new list. These are the functions that are currently loaded into memory. How would I use my function? Let's try it out. Type the name of the function. And in this case, it's expecting a number. So how about I put the number 100 into it? If we run this function, it's going to output 150. Because what this function does is it adds 50 to any number that goes in it. So you can write your own functions to accomplish um, all sorts of goals. 
I want to give you an example of solving this problem using a function. And uh, by doing it this way, we'll be able to make it a little bit more general. For example, imagine we want to choose how many random numbers to generate. We wanted to choose the range of numbers. And we wanted to uh, choose the cutoff value. So these are four parameters to choose. We could write our function um, that will allow four different kinds of inputs as our choices and then return the answer. Um, I'm going to call this some random numbers. This is going to be a new function. We write function. And um, let's create some input variables. N and N will stand for the number of numbers to sample. What else did we have? The range. So we can have min, max, and or let's just change that. I'm going to call it smallest, largest. And what else did we have? Oh, the 50. So we can have a cutoff value there. Cutoff. And just to make this a little bit more readable, I'm pressing return so we can see these listed uh, all in one place. And I've added my curly braces. I'm going to start writing the function. So the first thing we need to do is get some numbers. We wrote some code to do that. Let's put that in our function. Okay, so right now, we, uh, when we run this function, it's expecting uh, a few different things. The user is going to supply a value for n, and that we want that to change this property here, how many numbers are sampled. So we can just put n right there, and this number will go into this part of this random uh, number generator. We can put the word smallest into this part, the word largest into this part. And let's try to make this a little bit more readable. All right. Finally, uh, we were able to use a pretty short line of code to actually uh, select only the numbers above a particular value. It looked like this. And we can change this 50 with the word cutoff. And we can actually just write the word return all around this. Okay, let's select everything, press enter, and we should have a new function there in our list. There it is. And let's try it out. So our function is called sum underscore random underscore numbers. And it's expecting four things as an input. So we could say 100 numbers from 0 to 100 with a cutoff of 50. So if we run this, we can see that we get the final sum right away. It's automatically generated 100 numbers between 0 and 100, and it's uh, sl selected the ones that are greater than 50. It's added them all up. If we now change this to a 90, 
we should presumably get a smaller sum because fewer numbers will be larger than 90, and we do. And we can change any property of this, and so this is one of the values of writing a function. Okay, that's it for this tutorial. Good luck solving the other problems.